This is Weekend Edition from NPR News. I'm John Idstee. Two modest graves that rest side by side in the Montparnasse Cemetery in Paris have drawn a steady stream of visitors this spring. They contain the remains of two of the 20th century's most iconic intellectuals, Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir. This year marks the centenary of Ms. Beauvoir's birth, and her pioneering work, The Second Sex, is still regarded as a cornerstone of modern feminist thinking. Frank Browning has this look back at her life. There are a lot of reasons why Simone de Beauvoir is regarded as one of the towering figures of 20th century France. Her lifelong companionship with philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre, her many novels that are but thinly veiled diaries describing the private lives of the French post-war elite. But most important, says Annie cohen Salal, Sartre's biographer, is that Simone de Beauvoir was raised a proper Catholic girl whose radical personal life outraged France's archaic Catholic men. You know, France is extremely different from the United States on the point of view of feminism. The French are much more archaic. I mean, women were allowed to vote in France after World War II only, whereas feminism was active in the U.S. at the end of the 19th century. Beauvoir stepped into this very traditional society, so it's even more shocking for the French that she comes from this background, and she will be, together with Sartre, provoking French society. Therein lies the essential contradiction of Simone de Beauvoir. The prim, often austere child of faded aristocrats, she not only took up with a godless philosopher, but she then set down all the details of her life, including the intimacies of her other lovers and sarts. For her biographer, Hazel Rowley, Beauvoir became a model of what it meant to live and to love freely. I told my boyfriends at the time, just like Simone de Beauvoir and Sartre did, you have to love me in my freedom. Love is not about possession. Love is a very generous thing, which is about never holding anybody back. It's about not possessing people, but it's about actually loving them as free beings, which was difficult, I might add. It was difficult for them. It was difficult for me. There were many other women in Sartre's life who, with Beauvoir, constituted a new kind of extended family. But in a late magazine interview, read here by an actor, Sartre credited Beauvoir as always having been his first and finest critic. She was the only one at my level of knowledge of myself, of what I wanted to do. For this reason, she was the perfect person to talk to, the kind one rarely has. It is my unique good fortune. Their unique relationship may barely raise an eyebrow in 2008, but it certainly did in the 1960s. It was even more outrageous in 1949 when Beauvoir wrote about the status of women in the second sex. When the book came out, it both became a quick bestseller and it drew massive hate mail. Not least, Hazel Rowley notes, for Beauvoir's most famous line. On ne n'est pas femme, on le devient. One is not born a woman, one becomes a woman which, of course, means that we don't have anything like female nature, the feminine mystique, all these kinds of concepts Simone de Beauvoir attacked. She, she said that they were social conventions and that we choose to be women. We are programmed, we're socialized to be women, and that we are not determined in advance. Worse, she attacked the privileges of French men, who have maintained even today a caste system that's faded in the rest of the West. An actor reads this passage from The Second Sex. The advantage man enjoys is that his vocation as a human being in no way runs counter to his destiny as a male. His social and spiritual successes endow him with a virile prestige. is not divided. Whereas it is required of women that... In order to realize her femininity, she must make herself object and prey, which is to say that she must renounce her claims as a sovereign subject and submit to male authority. Unlike English and American polemicists, Beauvoir cast her arguments using the basic principles of the existentialist philosophy she and Sartre were building, that we each establish our own value through our actions, not through predetermined privilege. Unlike Sartre, however, Beauvoir made the philosophy human and touchable in daily life. Finally, though, it was Beauvoir's fearless gaze into the pains and exclusions of the marginalized that set her apart from almost everyone. 
in her seminal work on aging, like women in her youth, the old are cast aside. In this passage, she dwelt on her own face. I loathe my appearance now. The eyebrows slipping down towards the eyes, the bags underneath, the excessive fullness of the cheeks, and that air of sadness around the mouth that wrinkles always bring. Yes, yes, the moment has come to say, never again. Never again shall I collapse, drunk with fatigue, into the smell of hay. Never again shall I slide down through the solitary morning snows. Never again a man. Now, two decades after both Beauvoir and Sartre have died, it is she who is most remembered. And in the view of Sartre's biographer, Annie cohen Solal, Beauvoir, who has exercised the greatest influence. Simone de Beauvoir, she really applied the tools of existentialism to everyday life. For example, the way they live their personal life, you know, this recomposed family. It's something that was absolutely unthinkable, you know, in the French provinces when they were young. She handled it both as a thinker and as a woman in a very, very open way. Which is why this year has seen a half dozen new and reissued books praising and attacking, especially by men, her life and work. And why almost every week there's a seminar somewhere in the world about the work of Simone de Beauvoir. For NPR News, I'm Frank Browning in Paris.